So what we're going to do in this webinar is we're going to look in depth, in detail, at some actions that are coming up within XR. And these are actions that respond to the current crisis that we're in, and they're actions that also look at money and the economy as a way of reframing our actions in the light of this terrible crisis that we're in. So just a quick overview of what we're going to be doing uh, in this next hour that we're here together. So um, after you've met the three other panellists, I'm going to give a brief introduction. It looks like my dog is going to join us as well to give, uh, I'll give a brief introduction to give some framing to why action is going to have to look different, the challenges that we have doing non-violent direct action and civil disobedience, but also in some ways the new focus that COVID has given us on the economy. So I'll do about five minutes of that. We're then going to hear from two people who are planning concrete actions uh, in Extinction Rebellion at the moment. Um, we're going to hear about a rent strike and about a piece of physical question, uh, physical action as well. And then we're going to hear about the upcoming overall picture of XR actions, building up towards the possibility of another in-person rebellion on the streets. We'll then be handing over to questions. Um, for now, I'd like to introduce and welcome Roman, Blythe and Annika. So uh, they're going to give you 30 seconds just to introduce themselves uh, and tell them, uh, tell you who they are. Um, before that, though, I'll do that for myself. Um, so I'm Joel. Um, I'm from Cornwall originally. Um, my official local group is extraordinarily small um, and seemingly mainly is made up of people who are related to each other, which is most people in Cornwall. Um, but I've been lucky enough to be house sitting in London um, for a while and I've been full time with XR um, for every year now. So I was involved uh, in the April rebellion, uh, in the October rebellion, um, in actions including the fire engine outside the treasury, bit of a disaster, mostly, uh, and actions such as City Airport. Um, and a whole host of others. It's been a great and uh, a big adventure along the way. Um, I'm going to hand over to uh, Annika, if you could uh, introduce yourself and put your camera on and say who you are. That'd be great. Uh, my name's Annika. Um, I'm in Bristol and I've been enjoying a little bit of sunshine today as well. Um, I'm currently the internal coordinator of the UK Action Circle. Um, last year I spent uh, a long time coordinating actions in Bristol um, and then moved over to the UK team uh, just before the October Rebellion. Um, I also work in the DNA embodiment team as their strategy editor and, and coach for the DNA workshops and sessions. Um, so I'm going to be talking um, in a little while about um, how the sort of 2020 strategies developed uh, through a sort of time of COVID and what we've been up to in Action Circle, what we can still be doing. I'm from London and I've been involved with XR since the beginning really and yet yeah, have been just involved with the actions we've been doing for a while and I'll be here talking about No Going Back today which is the start of a new campaign that will be kicking off on the 30th of April and hopefully we'll yeah, get some very interesting stuff coming out of that. So looking forward to chatting about it. Nice to see you all here. Um, I am heavily involved with organising the XR Rent Strike, which is going ahead pretty speedily. Um, I'm also a writer and I've contributed to the Extinction Rebellion Hourglass newspaper. I've written for it about um, economic growth and how this is incompatible with the survival of the planet, um, if you want to check out my article. Um, and uh, before the rent strike, I was involved in media and messaging for Harangay, where I'm based, Harangay XR. So pass back to Joel. Great. Thanks so much, guys. So um, Blythe, uh, Centre of Religions Advance, that she might have to be in and out of video because she's not got the best internet connection there, but she uh, is not being rude if she does have to disappear. Um, OK, so five minutes from me before we hear in detail about these exciting actions that are being planned and how you can get involved. Um, so the context, the situation that we're in, uh, well, it, it's unprecedented and we, there's a load of hyperbole we can use um, and I'm sure you're, you're completely drowned out with fascinating, interesting insights into how the world was, how the world is going to be and how the world is right now. Um, but when it comes to planning actions, when it plans to participating and creating civil disobedience and non-violent direct action, the corona crisis has some very obvious uh, and very serious uh, implications. Now, the way that we're responding to that uh, in Extinction Rebellion um, is through lots of different attempts at creativity, at experimentation, um, and kind of workshopping of ideas. And you're gonna see some of the ones that have come out of that right now, which hopefully will work for you like a sort of sourdough starter. So you can take them off and start your own 
delicious loaves of actions based on the inspiration that these guys are going to give you. But one thing in particular that we're here to talk about today is the way that these things relate to money and the economy. Now, it's obvious that COVID uh, and the corona crisis has thrown up um, the problems of our economy in a serious way. Um, we don't need to go into too much detail, but it's apparent that we were not set up to deal with fragility, with vulnerability. We did not have a care-based economy, uh, as Blythe already alluded to. We had an insane growth-obsessed economy. Well, that in some ways does offer a through road for where we could be focusing our attention for fighting for a better world. The economy is one of those huge pillars, particularly with its finance industry here in the United Kingdom, that was fueling the climate and ecological crisis. To be precise about that, obviously, if we think about our GDP growth is a really great specific example of somewhere in which the insanity of our failed systems uh, is driving us off the cliff edge. Um, most governments profess to have GDP growth as their pretty much their number one policy priority, be, be them on the left or right. Most Western governments uh, aim for 3% GDP growth. Uh, but to put that insanity in context, a 3% GDP growth, well, that's compound. So it's 3% on top of 3% on top of 3%, which means in a century of that, that, that times your economy by 32 times. So that means within 100 years, if we continue growing like that, we'd be consuming 32 times the amount of the Earth's resources that we are right now. And we're already, most estimates put us on somewhere to two to two and a half times the use of the resources that the planet can cope with right now. Well, there's so many other examples of that that COVID is throwing up. And in many ways, it's also showing up that uh, historical examples can show us that the fallout of big crises like this can provide big breakthroughs. Uh, whilst in no way is this something that we would have wished, we do have to respond to the terrible nature of this crisis and realise that things like GDP have essentially been, well, they've been knocked off the priority stand, haven't they? The talk of replacing GDP with something like GPI, the Genuine Progress Indicator, that, that's on the cards, right? Talking about maybe well-being as a focus instead. Two positive examples of this, uh, we already had New Zealand had adopted the Happiness Index instead to uh, gauge its priorities. We have in Amsterdam, the adoption of Kate Rayworth's Donut Economics Model uh, to measure and balance well-being with GDP growth. Uh, and um, whilst not elected, our, our new uh, leader of the opposition, Keir Starmer, has uh, one of his pledges is to put a well-being indicator on equal footing with GDP. OK, well, that's the kind of the picture. And you can see if you, you look back at, say, the Second World War, um, things came out the other side of that crisis that people could not have imagined a way of fixing it. Um, good example of this is that the NHS, in many ways, was built on the foundations of the emergency hospital system that had to be built to deal with the World War II crisis. So it's possible that a new economy will have to be built on the back of this current response to this crisis that has, whether this government likes it or not, had to put well-being first. It's had to prioritise something more than GDP. Okay, and what about for us in non-violent civil disobedience? Um, well, as you, you know, if you guys here on this webinar have um, helped plan actions or been part of actions, there's sort of three main components that we try to do. Um, we try to be disruptive, we try to have an element of sacrifice, and we try to always be very respectful. Well, the obvious thing with that is that actually that criteria kind of rules out digital actions in some ways, because it's very hard to have that sacrifice element when you're hacking someone there, although you might end up eventually going to jail, but the sacrifice is much bigger than you expected if that was the case. And it's hard to keep that respect thing because you're not doing things in person. So as you'll see from our people talking about actions here, it really forces us to think totally outside the box. So within XR, ideas have been floating. There's a really exciting thing that we won't be hearing about in detail today, but it's called Earth Day Switch. I'll be posting this in the chat shortly. So there's a website helping people to switch their bank accounts, helping people to switch their energy suppliers so that we can be taking money away from it. But the thing that I'll briefly uh, finish with before handing over is that we're moving towards a new concept of civil disobedience to when we focus on the economy and on money. And that's to start thinking about in the light of non-cooperation. Now, Gene Sharp, who's sort of the, the godfather, the grandfather of nonviolent theory, identified lots of different ways you can do civil disobedience. But non-cooperation is something in which we, we stop doing something, right? So a tax strike, that's something that people have been exploring within XR right now. We refuse to pay our taxes if it's gonna be used to bail out the airlines, there's an opportunity. We can look back to historic examples like Mary Barber's uh, rent strike in Glasgow in 1915, just withholding your rent, hugely powerful thing, not to give too much away from what Blythe is gonna be talking about very shortly. 
um, more obvious recent example might be to look at the M NBA players uh, in the States who refuse to stand for the national anthem, another type of not doing something that can be very powerful. Uh, and so we're going to be exploring uh, versions of that when we hear about actions today. Um, so with that very specific example, it's a nice segue into hearing about a rent strike that has been planned by XR right now. And so I'm going to hand over to Blythe, who's going to give us five minutes to pitch it to you, tell you about the details and tell you how to get involved. Over to you, Blythe. Right. Thanks, Joel. So um, at the moment, renters are facing even more stress than they usually are because of this crisis. The situation is really dire for renters at the moment. So with lockdown and the loss of work, millions are having to prioritise rent over things, bare essentials like, uh, like food. It's, uh, and um, six letting agencies, six major letting agencies announced last month that 48% of rent was unpaid. So already people are unable to pay their rent altogether. So renters are really struggling. Mortgage payers get a holiday and we really think that renters should too. Um, so in our rent strike, we're calling for uh, rent suspensions throughout this crisis with no obligation to pay it back afterwards. And we're also calling for um, no going back because London has some of the high rents in the world, really bad in London. So um, call for a new rent pay controls so that um, we can have affordable rent in the capital and we can afford it live here. Um, I have to turn off your video I'm afraid you're going a little bit yeah. funky. Okay. So um, for it, the idea behind Extinction Rebellion's rent strike is this is um, a rent strike for the climate as well. Um, the idea is that our end of the month problem is integrally bound up with our end of the world problem. Basically, our immediate concerns are getting in the way of us thinking about and contemplating our very important end of the world concern, the climate crisis. And both rent and the climate crisis share that underlying problem, which Joel was talking about, the, um, the, the economic system, which is prioritizing growth, GDP and profit before people and the planet. So in our rent strike, we're also calling for progressive economic reform um, to, um, which might include a universal basic income and a Green New Deal. And we're also calling for a national citizens assembly to improve democracy and give us the people a say in, in politics and try and get those politicians to actually act on the promises they've been making for so long and not actually doing. Um, so this a rent strike is obviously quite a risky action to take and we are going to put in all the precautions possible so that people are protected from those risks. Uh, we're going to set up a bi-weekly assemblies for all strikers to meet one another and to form support networks based on shared concerns, shared landlord and shared lo location so that the people can do things like collectively send emails to landlords on behalf of people facing any risks. Um, and um, the way the rent strike will go ahead is we have a conditional commitment trigger of 5,000 people signing up. So this means that actually we won't withhold our rent until 5,000 people have pledged to join. This number, 5,000, is both um, low enough for it to be achievable, considering that there are 2.4 million renters in London, just about, and, uh, and it's also high enough for us to have power in numbers and to form support networks and to catch the attention, crucially, of the press and the government. So um, once 5,000 has been met, we will withhold our rent and start the rent strike. Um, and then from then on, we'll be holding bi-weekly people's assemblies and calling on the government to meet our demands. And we'll only end the rent strike either once our, our demands have been met or um, when uh, everybody participating in the strike has had a chance to vote on it. So this is obviously an action which um, you don't have to leave your house to participate in. You're easily abiding 
by lockdown rules. All you have to do is withhold your rent and we'll have the assemblies online. And we want to launch the rent strike around May the 8th on May Day, which is a festival calling for the good to come because in this action, we really want to focus on the idea of calling for a better future for everyone with affordable living, a better economic system and upgraded democracy. So to all of you listening, um, I really hope some of you might be interested in joining us. We're still in the organizing stage and uh, we're, in particular, we're looking for people for outreach and media and messaging. And if you are interested in joining, um, there should be an e yeah, the email address is in the group chat. So you can have a look at that and get in touch. Hope to hear from you soon. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Blythe. Um, and just to clarify, so one of the um, uh, questions in the chat. So the, uh, the aim is to get 5,000 individual renters to sign up, to conditionally say, say, I will go on rent strike if 5,000 people like me sign up. And uh, so it's not about 5,000 pounds. It's when 5,000 people sign up, then we will agree uh, to go on rent strike if we're participating in the rent strike. Um, so do keep those questions coming in. We're gonna, on the bigger questions, um, which we've got some interesting ones coming through Facebook, we'll be doing a discussion um, in a uh, short while. Um, okay, well, leading on from that, obviously, um, it, we've talked about some of the problems going on. Um, a very specific thing that's going on at the moment is bailouts. Um, we are, uh, as a, a, our money is being used by the government um, to bail out specifically the airlines at the moment and around the world, all the worst industries, not only getting our money to continue driving us towards extinction, but uh, they are fighting for deregulation as well. Um, Roman's here to tell us what he's going to do about it and how you can help him. So what we're going to do about it all together, Joel, <laughs> right, is, uh, is start with the, the No Going Back campaign. So there's a few actions that we have kind of set up as a part of that, but it's really to try and just to kind of say like a little bit about that, the No Going Back theme is it's kind of trying to draw a line in the sand. And while it kind of initially has maybe some negative feel like No Going Back, the idea is that we're really trying to kind of shine the light in this, in this sort of dark moment and all of these impossible things that the government is doing, all of these billions that they're gathering and they're able to give to people across the UK is, uh, was, was previously thought impossible only like a couple of months ago, like the Conservative government nationalising the railways, that seems crazy, but these things are all possible now. And so we are trying to push with this no going back is uh, a new story and this new direction that Joel was kind of talking about, this care economy, these things that we can achieve and are being done around the world. And um, that's really the kind of the whole energy within this No Going Back campaign to try and create a, uh, a place where like the essential workers of today, essential workers, previously the unskilled workers, stay cared for in a safe and resilient world. And we can all do this together. And so there are actions that we are gonna be introducing now, uh, starting on the 30th of April, to, um, so I'm going to turn my WhatsApp off so it doesn't keep beeping there. Um, so yeah, starting the 30th of April, we're going to start with some baby steps because this is going to be a prolonged campaign. This is just the beginning of what we're going to be doing. But we're going to start with a very clear, simple message. We've got posters made up that everybody can order. We'll put the information in. Okay, Joel's already done it for me. Amazing about how you can get those posters to your door. And it's just a clear and simple message asking the government, do you want to invest in this past and bail that out with billions that will take us backwards? and just keep us locked into a world that was on a path to destruction? Or do you want to invest in people and this new, green, progressive, caring future that we can do? We can achieve it right now. This is the moment to do it. And we have to right now. And so we're starting by just asking that clear, simple question to the government. Do you want to bail out the past or invest in the future? So in the next week, we're asking everybody to identify the, uh, the most reasonable targets in their local area, these companies that are fighting tooth and nail to get billions of pounds of taxpayers' pounds to put into their companies continuing in the exact same mode as they were, and uh, putting up the poster on their doors and taking a cute little selfie with it. We all know that we love to take a selfie, right, and put it on social media in these coronavirus times. We have to kind of interact with social media more, make more of an effort to make that a space that we can kind of progress the conversation. So get the poster up on the door of that business, of that company, of that industry, with that simple ask of the government, take a picture of it and then put it online that same evening, the 30th of April at 9 p.m. And then you can just put a few different uh, 
hashtags we've got on there to try and get that trending. And I mean, if you're like me, you have no idea about hashtags and kind of using those different things, but we just need to kind of get used to it and, and try and get the no going back hashtag out there as far as we can, because another world is possible. We can achieve these things and we're just going to start it with that simple ask, get the poster taken uh, or the picture taken with the poster up and then put it online. And uh, yeah, just put a honest, sincere message about why you decide to put that poster up, what it is that's driven you to do that. Put a story with that poster so it isn't just a kind of anonymous thing that is forgotten and taken down the next day, but there's meaning behind it and then you can start the conversation and hopefully it will go further. We're gonna follow up, so we're gonna follow up that uh, first action on the 30th of April when we're just going out for our daily exercise to put up the poster with a potentially more interesting action where we'll be aiming to lock the doors of those businesses that are temporarily closed. The date for that is still not currently set. As I say, we're going to go baby steps in this coronavirus period. But then see about trying to lock the doors physically of those businesses with people doing that sacrifice, going up because they believe strongly enough in drawing that line in the sand and we are not going to go in a different direction now that we can see this new green caring recovery that is essential to having a, a fairer world, basically. And um, yeah, the date will be circulated as we kind of get that more finalized, but we're going to be following up the postering with the locking it's kind of a continuing campaign. And then we also have other ideas flowing around right now within that same kind of financial non-cooperation space, non-compliance space that Bly was talking about with tax strikes. We're trying to potentially take out a small loan from banks and investing that in some kind of a project that is trying to take us in that good direction for that kind of fair economy. And, um, withholding that money and not paying it back as a part of this no going back campaign so then as we are mobilizing for these first actions that we have coming up we're going to be trying to then get people to do that similar um conditional commitment as Bly was talking about for the rent strikes to sign up for doing that debt strike against a financier of fossil fuels most likely but that's still to be decided but it's worth just kind of getting this out here and just getting that conversation going and seeing how people feel about that and as we get into this space of trying to just experiment with different actions, these are ideas that we're talking about right now. So we're gonna start with the postering, follow up with the locking, and then get into non-compliance as well. And then hopefully culminate at some point down the line when it's available in a, another mass event, as is already being done around the world, right? We've seen the pictures from Jerusalem. So these are things that we can do. And uh, yeah, there are infinite possibilities for what we can do in this moment. This goes for actions as well as for the way that we can take this country and uh, the economy and all these different things. So yeah, those are kind of the specifics, but there's a lot of interesting conversations. The 30th of April now going back starts and it's only gonna get more interesting from there. So please jump into the Telegram chat, jump onto our Facebook event page and we'll have more information to you all very soon and hopefully be talking about what you wanna be doing within that no going back campaign. Thanks, Roman. So much exciting stuff. So just to repeat those concrete details for you, if you missed it, it's 30 of April at 9 p.m. That's posters. That's the first round of it, followed by the next stages, depending on how things go, potentially locking the doors and looking at things like a loan strike from banks. Um, there is in the chat just there, I've posted the Facebook event. Do join that. And the Telegram chat if you want to stay posted for this uh, series of actions. No going back. So we've got some great questions coming into the chat. Um, some of them are about the rent strike. But before we go back to that and do those that question round, we're going to hear from Annika, who's from the UK XR Action Circle. And she's going to talk about uh, the possibility of doing another rebellion and the big picture of how all these actions fit into one pressure building campaign against government. And then we'll be going to some questions. So do keep them coming in uh, in the chat and we'll be on to question and answers quite shortly. Annika. Thanks, Joel. And yeah, great to hear about these, uh, the amount of energy and these other actions going on. Um, so I just want to start by saying something short about how we still target the government, because we've just spent a whole week doing webinars on uh, the finance industry particularly. And if you've been to one of our DNA strategy sessions, you'll know we use a tool called the Pillars of Power um, and looking at the, the pillars that hold up the status quo of um, the current, you know, what's going on in our society, in our country, in the world. Um, and financial institutions are one of these pillars that, um, that have a huge amount of power in um, making the status quo what it is. 
Um, but we are still messaging the government in every action we do. So when we target financial institutions, we might be um, indirectly still targeting the government because we're asking the government to change the laws or to, uh, or to you know, force the financial institutions to move money. Particularly in these bailouts, the question is still to the government. So I just wanted to highlight that um, before going into a bit more detail. Um, the 2020 strategy, um, which we released in January, obviously before we knew anything about COVID, um, really, I think the crux of it for me when planning actions is thinking about how it moved from emergency messaging um, of last year. Last year, our biggest aim was to shift public opinion on the climate and ecological emergency, which um, I think we had huge success in doing that. Um, and the nuance of the strategy this year was to move more into a critique of the systems and um, and help people understand just how vulnerable and fragile we really are and how fragile our global systems are um, uh, in, in terms of protecting us from such crises as a pandemic or uh, the climate crisis. And I think we're now in a stage where we really are seeing how vulnerable we are because of COVID. Um, and we perhaps have then had a bit of a change in, in pace about you know thinking about what kind of actions we want to be doing. Um, the last month we've all been having a period of, of quiet and uh, reflection, well a lot of us have, um, uh, you know, having to really put empathy first and a lot of us have been out helping in our communities um, and helping with sort of mutual aid projects and things which is absolutely amazing and you know it's just wonderful that XR shows so much love and everything it does in that sense. But I think, you know, a month of lockdown has gone by and a lot of us are starting to think about, are we going to have a rebellion again? What's the path through? Um, you know, a few weeks ago, we just felt wrong to be thinking about that. But I think we're coming through that time and starting to have um, some energy for planning actions again. And I think we have to be really careful, particularly right now. I don't think it would be right for us to go rushing out on the streets together right now during lockdown. But there will be a time in a few weeks or months where we can imagine doing something again on mass together. And that may have to be a very carefully social distanced action. Um, and there's some great examples recently. There was one in Israel this week where they were protesting about democracy and they actually worked well together with the police to mark out uh, spots on the ground six feet apart in a grid in a, in a town square. Um, and it was um, in the news uh, internationally, it was, it was acclaimed as a, as a successful protest and, and didn't seem to get bad press for going out during during COVID times. So obviously we're in a different position in the UK. Um, the only example we have here currently um, that I've seen in the press this week was the Cambridge rebels were out doing some spray painting and that didn't get such good press. They were, the headline was, you know, XR rebels breaking lockdown. Um, so I think we've got to be really careful with whether we're Sort of going out or not and doing things at the moment. Um, we did release some, some guidelines to help rebels think about, um, about that which you can find online, I'll link to them in a bit. Um, but I think you know the main thing is we have to be careful we're not going out for the sake of boredom just because we're itching to go and do something. We're really trying to think about the messaging and the framing, um, the narrative over the next month or two of what do we really need to be saying and what is right to be saying. Um, and the No Going Back campaign is really exciting because No Going Back can mean so many different things. You know, we don't want to go back to um, being in an economy that's driven by growth, as Joel was talking about, and fossil fuels uh, rule everything. We, but we also want to be moving forward, um, keeping this prioritization of well-being and respecting uh, key workers as well. So there's so many aspects to not going back. Um, and really, you know, we, we can't go back. There is no going back. It's, it's, it's a fact as much as an aspiration, really. So I think we're aware that, you know, the real pressure needs to be on how the economy is reshaped and regrown. And a lot of other organisations are saying similar things right now. Um, the impossible is now possible. Uh, you know, Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, lots of other movements that have sort of got the same vision as us and we want to be working alongside, really recognising that um, now is the time to be talking about how, how we rebuild the economy in a way that prioritises people and planet and a sustainable future. Um, so there's lots that we can be doing. There are lots of other stuff uh, going on now. We talked a bit about digital actions. Um, we can still be disruptive online and on the phone lines. We're looking at a really um, great proposal at the moment called Actions Hotline, which is looking at a network of 
um, of people on the phones uh, calling up government offices and with respect uh, telling them what they think, um, asking, you know, putting them in the dilemma that what Roman was talking about too. So there's digital actions, there's, there's HS2 still going on, which has a huge link uh, talking about money actions because that is just indicative of the type of thing the government are plowing ahead with at this time. Um, as something that you know has economic benefit but not much else to anyone and they're cutting down you know ancient woodland and we're, we're all completely distraught seeing videos of that so there is um action you can do online about hs2 and calling government officers about that um so we're developing those things and we're starting to think about um the path over the next couple of months of, of building towards a time where we could be out again um, and doing something probably uh, in a very respectfully socially distanced way depending on government guidelines and what we know is going to be best for our health um, but yeah that's where we're sort of at I'm also in a group called the rebellion weavers um, which look at ideas and bring together um, a lot of the different workings particularly around thinking around those big rebellion events um, and you can email us um, I'll pop that email in the chat as well uh, with any ideas thanks Joel Great. Thanks so much, Annika. Yeah. So as you can hear, um, despite the challenges of being in a lockdown and in this extraordinary crisis, uh, new ideas are coming through. So we've heard about the rent strike. We're going to just have some questions at a moment's time. We've had these no going act actions. And as Annika is saying, inspired by Israel uh, in protest in particular, we've got the possibility of doing strict social distancing style uh, symbolic protest um, rebellion of some variety coming up. Uh, going to be controversial, going to be full of ideas. If you've got questions about that, do feel free to put them in the chat. Um, so, uh, Facebook, Instagram uh, is going uh, hot on the rent strike. People are interested. People are uh, full of questions. Um, so, Blythe, if you're with us, um, we have got a lot of questions. I'm going to just pull out a few of them and summarise the other ones. Um, so, there's some questions about how rent connects to climate. What's the connection there directly? Uh, and specifically, uh, we've got a landlord here saying, um, I'm a landlord who cares about the about the environment. So um, how do they fit into this if someone's rent striking against them? How do they play their part in this change? So what's the connection between rent and the climate? Uh, and how do landlords fit into this, Blythe? Okay, so in terms of the connection with the climate, there is three main reasons why there is a connection. The first is the, um, as I said, rent is part of this economic system which is profiting from people's basic needs as much as it is profiting from planetary resources and um, exploiting both of these things. Um, so there's a broad connection in terms of the economy. Um, the second connection for climate activists is that um, rent is one of those things which is it's rent is so extortionate in london and i just want to add um this rent strike is london based uh sorry not to have mentioned that before um we yeah we so um in rent is extort we might go national or international or later if it goes well but um rent is extortionate in london and um and it's one of those things which people end up they, they're a slave to they're continuously slaving to pay their rent and um, and this means that they don't have the time to consider issues like the climate crisis that's the second reason and the third reason is the um, the kind of environmental cause of the the COVID crisis and um, as in the encroachment of um, urbanization into lands of, the, of the, in, lands in Wuhan where the bats are living and um, how this has meant that we've had to go on lockdown which has meant that renters are under even more stress so there is a link it's um, quite complicated but it, it's there um, especially in terms of an economic system which is exploiting both our basic needs and the planet um, uh, to the landlord, hi, <laughs> I'm very sorry, but um, you are a privileged group compared to us renters. Um, you have a mortgage holiday and we don't have a rental holiday. Um, we don't want to disrupt you or uh, yeah, what's going on for you. And we understand there's lots of different types of landlords in London. But um, um, we're going to be encouraging all our strikers to communicate with our landlords um, and we'll offer email templates to everyone to uh, 
communicate with their landlords why they're going on strike and there'll be the opportunity to open up a dialogue with renters. So that's my answer to those two questions. Are there any more? I can talk uh, a bit. That, well, we might come back to some more questions on rent strike in a bit, Bly. So thanks for that for now. We'll, we'll go to a question that brings us all together, if that's all right for now. Um, but uh, fighting talk, thank you. Um, fascinating stuff. And I think it's going to be, it's going to get some uh, interesting attention. So um, one of the questions coming up here, and it's one that I wanted to ask um, my self is um so what what does this mean what these actions mean for sort of individuals in in local groups all around the country um and i was wondering if i could hear from our three panelists uh, i think we'll start with roman now um for what what advice would you give to an action planner who's trying to come up with a new action right now in the time of covid and maybe you could draw on your experience coming up with the ones you've just just planned um any pointers for coming up with a creative action to respond to the crisis like the ones we've just heard about yeah, I think um, <clears throat> I'm actually going to start with your like sourdough analogy, John, just because I think that's really fitting. Like making bread isn't easy. Do you know what I mean? Like you don't make the perfect loaf the first time. So actually just like keep having conversations about it. That sounds really basic, but just like with your local groups, like you've got time now, just have like the wackiest creative conversations you can have. I think also don't just be kind of uh, stuck to having to think about what you can do right now with social distancing rules think about what we can do when there was, if there isn't social distancing, when there is potential for a rebellion again, just like put everything out there and just see what you're talking about. In this moment when we have got very strict guidelines, you don't want to be kind of putting the emergency service under more strain sort of thing. Um, that's, that's all great. And like, we need to be considering those things as well. And that's kind of, I mean, that's what led us down the road of the starting with the postering for no going back, taking a picture with that photo. So like you are there present with it. Um, but doing things kind of baby steps and I think having also more than just like one action planned have a kind of uh, an escalation or kind of some like pressure building actions so like once you've thought of an idea see how you can develop it into something that's a little bit more interesting I think it's just really important that we keep remembering that we need to challenge the government in this moment still like we need to make demands otherwise nothing will change and it's up to us to be able to do that um, coming together do you know what I mean that's how we're gonna be able to force some changes. And people still remembering that actions is how that happens is really important. So even if it's just something simple, just going out to do something like postering or painting the streets with a spray can, when you're going out to do your daily exercise, it's crucial because we need to remember that this is how we're gonna force change when we all come together. And that's really what XR's strength has always been. That's how this movement gained any credence was because we did actions and we just went for it and people need to remember that. So just have conversations with your mates, do a Zoom pub session, like have a beer and just talk about what it is that you think you know, like your wildest dreams XR could achieve and then just obviously like work back from that and uh, trying to kind of stick to the rules that we have in place right now. Just do something really small, but do something and then just build on that. Have a kind of a, a line that you're gonna follow through really. Um, yeah. Great, thanks, Roman. Um, Annika, w when you're thinking about actions right now, um, how how do you start? Have you got any principles yourself that are sort of guiding you to think about actions? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I think the starting point right now is empathy and sensitivity for me. That does that really does have to be there uh, more than usual. Um, you know, we always try to do things with with great amount of respect, but I think you know. People are losing their loved ones. People are having a having a tough time. So, um, so that does need to be first and foremost. I think timing is really important to consider. Um, timing of this lockdown. You know, if things are going to be loosened in the next few weeks, there might be a window there where it is going to be more appropriate to to go out and do things. Um, you know, the, the social distancing guidelines are for our protection and, and protection of, you know, nature, other people. So we do really do have to respect them. Um, I think, you know, thinking, as I mentioned earlier, about your motivation at this time, what's your motivation? Is it because, you know, you really want to take this message to the right place and this is what you believe is, is going to be part of making change? Or is it because you're 
really bored and you just want to go out and do something and you're a bit angry <laughs> um i think you know really looking to make sure it's rooted in in what you're saying and and more than anything is creativity i think there's loads of ways to be getting the message out now the paint the streets campaign is looking fantastic you can you can do some painting out on your daily jog um, things like projections, um, sculptures, you know, if there's something you can be making in your home that you can go and, um, you know, leave outside your local supermarket. Think about those places where there are lots of people gathering. Supermarkets is the biggest one at the moment. Um, so there are ways of doing, doing some actions. And I think my, my last point would be just about capacity. Um, often we have really big ideas. And um, right now, I think, you know, there are less people in XR active in the way that they are normally. So just making sure that your action is still supported in all the ways it needs to be. Um, you know, don't sort of run out with half a team ready. It's, it, yeah, just thinking about capacity. And if, um, you know, you've got a great idea and you're looking, um, you're looking to make it bigger, I think, you know, do the research, get on social media, get on, on Google and find out if anyone else has already set up a petition and campaign for it and join forces and, and make it bigger than it could have been on its own. Um, if you are quite new to XR um, and, and watching this, do get online, find your local group. They're still doing weekly meetings on Zoom every week. Most local groups are, and there's still inductions uh, and DNA workshops online. So you can get involved and hear more about things um, by Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all those things. Fantastic. And uh, whilst we're here, um, some more uh, bits of sourdough starter, I guess, to throw out there. Some other actions that I've heard um, bubbling around that you that might give you some inspiration that they've given me. Um, there was a, uh, an idea going around to go out uh, and paint new cycle lanes on the streets now that they're empty to prioritise and show that, you know, what we want is renewable, sustainable uh, transport. Um, Animal Rebellion, our sort of um, sister movement, um, did a fantastic action where they went to uh, a McDonald's and they closed it, uh, it was already closed obviously, but they sealed it off with yellow and black tape uh, and put a big hazard sign up saying hazard, animal products, danger of future pandemic. So if you're obviously of the vegan persuasion, this is powerful action. Uh, it didn't, it got coverage in plant-based news, but nowhere else. But presumably after the rebellion, uh, after the lockdown, things start getting more um, with that. Um, a nice action that was bouncing around that um, I'd like to go and try out was to go to a billboard, paint it over, um, with that paint that works like a chalkboard, uh, put a box of chalk next to it uh, and say, how do we build a better world? Or, or what do you want after this? Um, and you can see here how you'd have, uh, you know, hopefully invite some participation into it. So one interesting question that was coming up on um, the chat was specifically towards the rent strike. Actually, it's quite relevant to what um, Roman was talking about as well. Um, and that was uh, to ask, what could we do with the money that we would have paid in rent? So if we're withholding that money, could we put it towards a sustainable fund or like a social inclusion fund to help the homeless? Um, so I actually visualize, prefigure the idea um, of redistribution. Uh, so there's obviously the rent strike money, but then there's also potentially doing that loan strike, the overdraft strike from banks that Roman was talking about. So I'll put that to you first, Blythe. Um, what, what do you think about using that money for something uh, good? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting idea. For the rent strike, it's a bit difficult because a lot of people can't pay rent anyway during the crisis. So we we were thinking maybe we could take donations instead of full rent. And um, but and there's obvious practicalities involved setting up a collective account for all the money to go in or and and things like that. But um, yeah, it's definitely something we've contemplated. Um, Give, using it for further activism or putting it towards a good cause or something like that. But yeah, I think that's a brilliant idea. Uh, Roman, what do you think? About the, um, the debt strike? Yeah, you were, you were talking about how the idea of taking out loans or yeah. overdrafts. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think it's like a really interesting development and this, this, the whole thing of like non-compliance, it's just like a space that hasn't really gotten into. And as we're trying to get more inventive, this could potentially be uh, like one of the most interesting things that we've done. And yeah, just when it's this really clear messaging as to why you're taking that money from that place and then putting it together into something uh, really, really progressive, some kind of a project that is looking for funding as well, I think would be a really interesting dynamic. It would be a huge dilemma for the institution that you've taken the money from and then trying to kind of get that back from you. So it's definitely something that we're looking into within the no going back thing to try and make that, uh, make that come to fruition. 
Great stuff. Yeah, and just but just build on what uh, Roman was saying there. Obviously, I said at the beginning, there's you know the sacrifice, uh, dis, uh, disruption, respect, crucial part of it. Um, but causing this dilemma moment for your opponent in some ways there. Um, that, I mean, obviously with the possibility of using money, say from a fossil fuel bank, to buy a bit of land and plant a forest on it. Um, if I, you know, if there was some way in which the dilemma was, do they come and reclaim the land and the forest and you know claim it back from you? That would be a dilemma to put them in. Um, ultimately, though, as Annika says, we're trying to lead it back towards the government in our messaging um, all of the time. Um, so and the question that I wanted to put to you all um, is that uh, what what does what does disruption mean now for Extinction Rebellion? And I don't just mean in the short term. I mean more in like the year next two years. So, uh, you know, it was only a couple of months ago that we were looking at using tactics that would deliberately overwhelm the police. We were using tactics that would deliberately try and drain their resources, cost as much money as possible, block roads, shut down the city, and try and raise this cost of economic disruption uh, over the cost of negotiation. That that was the strategy, and that was sort of one of XR's sort of fundamental, uh, you know, stra strategies overall. Um, but right now we're in a situation where COVID has just knocked 35% off the uh, of our GDP. Um, we're looking at probably the worst financial recession since the Great Depression. Uh, what do, what does disruption mean anymore? Is there such thing as disruption? Um, I'll put that to you, Annika. I thought you might. <laughs> um, yeah, really good question. Um, and you know, our relationship with the police has developed very interestingly over the last year. And obviously, that is different in different places. Our relationship with the Met Police is different to our relationship with the Bristol Police, for example. Um, I think. You know, going out, doing any action right now that purposefully disrupts the emergency services and puts pressure on them could look very, very silly. Um, it's, it's clearly not the right time right now to do that. And I think, you know, we're having to think quite carefully about when that may be appropriate again if, if, if we do move to doing something like that. I think what I would really love to see coming out of this is a stronger relationship with the police where they recognise even more the state of the emergency we're in and the truth that we're telling and they work with us, um, you know, to, to allow our, our protests more in, in London when we get that chance. Um, you know, I was really impressed with, with the police in Israel uh, helping mark out the grid for a socially distanced um, protest. So that's what I would love to see. And I, I think there's been an interesting development this last week because the Home Office has actually forced the bill of our previous protests back onto Scotland Yard. Um, and I think, you know, how our conversations with the Met Police play out with that, following that will be very interesting because you could look at that um, from a perspective of, of saying well it puts us more on the same side because they're going to be annoyed the home office have, have sort of given them the bill when really we were intending to um to put the pressure on the government via the police as as adopted by the state so um so i think that's really interesting and um i'll be checking in with our, our police liaison to see uh, see how that's going but yeah i think disruption right now um, is very different to what it's been before um, and it's probably going to continue to be less disruption of the public uh, which seemed to be the way our strategy this year was sort of going. We're wanting to focus more on critiquing the systems that are causing the problems of our toxic system, um, putting more pressure on the on the fossil fuel industries and the bankers and, and those industries that are causing so much damage and giving the government the dilemma of, of changing those systems. Uh, rather than disrupting the public um, and I think that's the general way in which we're going you know we're still messaging the public in everything we do we still want to bring the public on board um, but yeah how we think about disruption has changed. Uh, Blythe, Roman, either of you want to come in on this? Um, yeah sure um, so I think um, uh, uh, this crisis has forced us to think about new ways of um, of doing actions and um, and um, considering all the different options, I think um, it has forced us to use our imaginations and diversify our actions a lot. Um, in terms of being arrested, being arrested means an entirely different thing to people of color to than to white people. So. Um, I us diversifying our actions will be 
in Australia will become more accessible to people as we consider more things which don't don't involve being arrested being arrested so that's one thing and um the second is um yeah i think um maybe we'll move more there'll be more online actions with this crisis and we'll explore more ideas involving technology and things like that i think it could get quite interesting thanks Blythe. and on that note um just shout out for anyone who's um following the chat on the webinar um there there is a action aimed at america's pipeline project so there's the money pipeline action um that's today if you look in the chat there's a google doc um to having a look at that and with regards to the bike lanes that we were talking about earlier um there's a potential for uh, work in berlin new cycle lanes that are put in temporarily during the crisis um are going to be adopted in the long run so this might have a lasting change on sustainable transport uh, in that way um roman you're planning actions actually out on the street which does involve disruption but i throw an additional question to you um with fines for being outdoors uh potentially if you're breaking lockdown um do, what sacrifice as well as disruption has taken on a very different meaning um what 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 would you say if you were you face to face with the rebel right now who was going to be out there thinking about sacrifice and disruption yeah i mean obviously you have to be very clear on the motives that you have like annika was saying as well like we have to feel the things that we're doing and what our reasoning is for it and we believe really strongly in the things that we are doing. It isn't just kind of for the sake of doing something that we are trying to plan some actions in this moment. It's because it's essential that we do and continue that conversation and push for something radically new to come out of this moment. And so you just have to be sitting with that for a little bit. And if you're comfortable with it and then willing to go out and kind of go through whatever the consequences are, whether it's like some kind of a fine um, or more if you're willing to be arrested for doing something like clearly targeted and focused and safe in this moment, then, um, then it's like your decision to make, but it, it could be worth doing, right? There can be any number of ripple effects from an action that you take and it could be influencing any number of people to do something different or think about in a, think in a different way about where we are and, uh, where we could be. So yeah, I think, um, we have to be really careful about what we're doing right now, but, there is definitely still scope for us to do actions and and we absolutely have to because if we don't then we'll just have no say over the direction that we go following this unprecedented moment um yeah and i, I think yeah that, that disruption is going to look different like the other guys were saying there as well but just to just quickly add to that conversation i think that the non-compliance is going to be one of the most interesting angles that we could take in the future and that's just going to look differently because it's going to be kind of a more drawn out campaign it won't necessarily be just like a one big bang kind of moment where we all gather in the same place at the same time and trying to overwhelm the police in that way but it'll be a more kind of drawn out campaign and uh there'll be like multifaceted elements to that so we're not going to go back to any of the things that we were using before and we didn't need to and supporting each other through that through all the mutual aid groups that people are setting up right now that's just going to be uh, invaluable in the things that we're going to be doing coming up. Um, yeah, as they did in like the kind of the, the poll to anti poll tax strikes, uh, people supported each other through that in a huge community push and similar kind of things. I think may be coming up if we if we try and go down that route. Thanks, Roman. Um, and I'll add to that. Um, that in answer to my own question. Um, that right, one one of the interesting uh, sort of uh it's advice i had from someone recently um who was you know who's been long long-term activist was saying that um that one of the things that we need to remember as xr right now is that part of our job is radical truth telling um and that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be particularly popular about it either um and the example but we've got to be very careful with using churchill examples it seems like second world war um analogies are about as contagious as coronavirus itself at the moment but um when it came to the 30s and hitler um was beginning to Look very aggressive. Um, Churchill was a nobody. Um, he he said, "We've got to rearm. We've got to do something about this. This guy's going to try and conquer Europe." Um, when he moved a motion to do so, only four MPs stood with him, and he was laughed out of the chamber. Um, seven years later, when um, Hitler invades Czechoslovakia and invades Poland, um, suddenly that radical truth thing that Churchill had done all those years ago uh, meant he was the obvious person to be prime minister. So, whilst we're not 
quite try and overthrow the government um, and get into government ourselves, there is something uh, worth thinking about that, that, you know, even if it makes you hugely unpopular, which it might make us right now to be doing actions, um, there is a law of physics reality to our situation right now. And that is that um, there is one much bigger crisis than COVID and it's right here, right now, regardless of what we're going to do with it. Um, and so we're going to move towards um, checking out as this is um, at the end of it. Um, I want to just do a quick uh, plug for what's coming up in the series. So um, tomorrow uh, evening, we've got Kate Rayworth uh, on uh, TV, um, who I mentioned earlier, um, is of Donut Economics. If you haven't read about Donut Economics, um, get yourself a donut and get yourself the book. It's fantastic. And um, it's actually been the inspiration for some action ideas that are bouncing around, potentially taking some donuts to... Uh, local councils or government buildings to say this is the model we want you to adopt. If you haven't read about donut economics that might be a bit random to you but really recommend checking out there's some good videos online. Um, also coming up next week when we're outside of the money talk thing we're going to be moving into a regular slot uh, for an actions workshop space and that's going to be at Wednesday at 6 p.m. next week and then every week that Reset TV goes on as we film them. Um, so next week we've got some uh, pretty exciting guests uh, including Angie Zelter um, who of uh, Trident Plowshares who did one of the most astonishing actions as far as I'm concerned of all time doing two million pounds worth of damage to a Hawker fighter jet that was due to go and bomb uh, during a genocide uh, and lived to tell the tale, got out of jail um, doing so. So if you want to hear all about that and other activists, it's going to be Wednesday at 6pm next week. So spread the word on that. Uh, if you've been inspired to think a bit more about action ideas yourself, um, there and you know we're all locked inside, um, recommend getting some books, doing some reading about it. Um, just for a first point of call, just for some like just crazy ideas to really get you thinking, just couldn't recommend enough, Blueprint for Revolution by Sergei Pogthik. So um, he was one of the co-leaders of the movement called Opal that overthrow Milosevic in Serbia and it's a hilarious book just full of great ideas really entertaining will get you thinking about things that we could be doing right now. Um, uh, two other recommendations this is an uprising um, and another one is by Mika White and it's called The End of Protest so that's Blueprint for Revolution, This is an Uprising, End of Protest. Read any of those you have a great time. Well I'm going to say thank you very much but I'm just going to hand over to our panellists to say uh, goodbye and any last uh, call to action they'd like to give you for getting involved in their action. Um, so Blythe. Thanks very much Joel for having me. Um, yeah the rent strike is about um, calling for a better future for our basic needs and for the planet. Um, if you're on board with that then great get in touch with our email address which I'll put again in the group. Thanks. I'll pass on to Annika. Thanks, Blythe, and thanks, Joel, for presenting that so beautifully. Um, yeah, it's been a real privilege to, uh, to talk to everybody. And um, yeah, similar to what Blythe said, really, uh, don't be a stranger. If you've got ideas or you want to talk about you know, developing your actions team in your local group, or you want to know where you can get trained up for things, or you want to become a trainer, or you know, you want to talk anything about action planning, whatever, please do get in touch. The action circle email is xr-action at protonmail.com. Um, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and thanks for coming, Roman. Yeah, likewise. Um, it was really nice chatting with you all. Thanks very much for hosting us there, Joel. Really nice listening to the, uh, the rent strikes and just what's going on with XR. And yeah, just actions, what we need to be doing, just like think creatively. I think also like banner drops would also be fine at the moment. Um, repainting bike lanes would also be cool. Uh, just little things you can do. We talked about Earth Day Switch, switching your bank account or your energy provider. And if you're really serious and just do research, like Joel was saying, do some reading, like place free of information requests, look into which are the most... Uh, like subsidized fossil fuel companies in the UK, see which ones are like struggling at the moment and think about what you can do to target them and really like just push them over the edge in this moment when we uh, yeah, have incredible potential for where we can go after this and just like plan accordingly. Yeah, just keep thinking basically. But very nice chat to you all. Cheers. <laughs>